Leaders' questions. And could I call on Deputy Billy Keller on behalf Kim of Kula. the uh, Tanishta, at the heart of the government's uh, policy in terms of the programme for government are two key issues with regard to health. Was one the introduction of free GP care for everybody by the end of this uh, government's lifetime, and that uh, universal health insurance would also be established uh, after the next election. Now, by any stretch of the imagination, when you look at the progress to date, it has been very minimal, to say the very least, and that would be polite. But with regard to universal health insurance itself, uh, Tanishta, we now have a situation where the funding model that's being proposed by the Minister for Health is a form of universal health insurance. And at the same time, we have two key ministers in government, the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, who are cynically undermining that particular proposal. Now, when you look at the, at the proposals brought forward by Minister Riley, he said at the, at the outset, before the last election, that nobody would pay any more than they're paying already with regard to health insurance. Now, clearly that has not happened in the, in the interim, with escalating uh, private health insurance policies, year in, year out, uh, massive increases, forcing families to abandon it at up to 6,500 people per month. Now, we are waiting for the publication of the White Paper Tarnished on universal health insurance. And last Monday, the Minister for Finance uh, was quite robust in undermining the actual principle of universal health insurance, saying that it would expose the state to huge costs and expose the families to huge costs. Coupled with last week's uh, announcement by uh, the leaks from uh, Minister Howland's office, that families would have to pay up to €1,600 Euros for the basic health cover that's been proposed by Minister Riley. So what I'm asking Tanisha today is, one, do you, do you agree that the panacea that was announced by uh, Minister Riley three years ago, that nobody would pay anything more than they're already paying, is now a fallacy in the sense that people are already paying uh, substantial sums uh, over and above that? And number two, the white paper itself, when will it be published so that we can have an informed debate on this issue? We're depending on scraps from leaks from government, from individual ministers, trying to undermine what is a central core principle with regard to this government in delivery of universal health insurance. So, Minister, w would you agree that this should be published immediately, that we should have an informed debate on it? Because quite clearly the document we published last year would indicate that it won't be a utopia uh, if we introduce universal health insurance as proposed by Minister Riley, because simply it will cost an awful lot more than presently people are paying in terms of private health insurance. And also, Thank you. is Labour happy? Is Labour happy with now giving over health insurance to private companies, these being the ones that will decide whether or not health is rationed and what sort of basic policies you, will be put in place with regard to cover for ordinary families in this country? Thank you. Ken Corla, well, the government um, is agreed to the introduction of a policy of universal health insurance. Uh, that has been the policy of my party uh, for more than a decade. Um, it is something that is coming after a period of Fianna Fáil government uh, when uh, you showed no interest in reforming uh, the unfair two-tier health sy system. Uh, that we've had for a long time in this country, and you still don't, of course, uh, which is why you've opposed uh, the uh, government's proposals to give a break uh, to families uh, with the medical care for their children. This government believes that people should be treated based on medical need, uh, not on the amount of money that they have in their pockets, uh, and that people that get sick know that they can get treated uh, in good time. We also want to change the incentives to the health system so that the majority of people get treated in their communities and don't end up unnecessarily uh, in A&E or in a hospital bed. And that makes sense when it comes to keeping people healthy, and it makes sense when it comes to spending the taxpayers' money in a way that is most effective. That's why, for example, the government has put an emphasis on putting in place the building blocks for a universal health insurance system, it's why we decided to lower the cost of accessing primary care for people, starting with the introduction of free GP visits for children aged five and under. And it's also why we're building up the primary care system. Now, the introduction of universal health insurance is a major reform project. It's not going to happen overnight, and it's important that we get it right. And we're not rushing it. There's a lot of preparatory work that has to be done. The white paper is part of that. It will be the basis for the consultation 
including what should be included in the guaranteed basket of services. Other preparatory work is also going on, such as the introduction of money follows the patient across the public hospital system and free GP care for children under five and under. Uh, regarding cost, as I've said, we have to proceed cautiously. We want a more efficient health system that delivers better value for taxpayers, and we also need to keep health insurance affordable. We're at an early stage in this. The Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and the Department of Finance, as you would expect them to do, are doing their job, which is to uh, probe the uh, costings uh, and to maintain an oversight uh, of policy in terms of its cost implications at an early stage. We want, over time, to reform the health service so that it treats people as early as possible, as efficiently as possible, and to do that we want to keep health costs affordable for families uh, and for the taxpayer. Uh, the alternative, of course, is the Fianna Fáil alternative, which is to do nothing and to allow a drift. That's not acceptable uh, to us. The White Paper <coughs> is being prepared. Uh, it will be published in the not-too-distant future, and it will provide an opportunity then for all of us to have an input into uh, the discussion on uh, where universal health insurance, how it's progressed. Thank you. Deputy Kelleher, one minute. The Thank party you. may have been proposing a universal health insurance model, but it certainly was on a funding system of social insurance as opposed to private insurance companies being the ones that would be funding the health model, Tanishta, and there's quite a large difference between the two. Uh, at the outset, Tanishta, you said that you want to introduce a policy that would give access to people based on their medical need as opposed to their ability to pay. Now, in the last couple of months, you've decided to announce free GP care for those of six and under. But at the same time, you're funding that particular initiative by taking medical cards off the sickest in our society. Yes, yes, yes. So the idea that you come in here and say that you want to ensure that people will access treatments based on their need simply isn't even credible. When you look at what you have done with regard to discretionary medical cards, week in, week out, withdrawing them from the sickest and the most vulnerable in our society. So, Tanishta, would you accept at this stage that after three years, we now have a situation where the Minister for Health has been completely isolated uh, in government. We have the Minister for Finance, who consistently, by his policies, undermines the basic principle of universal health insurance. Thank you, Deputy. And that's having a dynamic private health insurance market uh, where people can afford uh, private health insurance. Every policy that the Minister for Finance has brought in in this House has undermined that basic principle. Reductions in capping and tax relief, and now further threat to remove tax relief altogether from hard pressed families. Now, the point I'm trying to make, uh, Tanisht, is you're talking about a universal health insurance model whereby it will be um, health insurance companies will be the ones that will actually fund the system through people taking out uh, health Thank insurance. You. And by any stretch of the imagination, and looking at it coldly and clinically, you're undermining that basic principle day in, day out, by the policies that you've pursued for the last three years. So finally, when will the White Paper be published, and will it have detail and costings? Because the public out there want to know whether or not Minister Howland is scaremongering or telling the truth with regard to €1,600 Euros per person with regard to universal health insurance costs. Well, first of all, let me correct a number of issues of fact. First of all, the Labour Party position on universal health insurance, which was initially published in 2001, provided for and proposed that there should be a number of health insurers which would uh, be part of the universal health insurance, one of which would be a public service provider. That was the and is the position of the Labour Party in relation to universal health insurance. Secondly, with regard, with regard to medical cards, you're also wrong. This government is providing a half a million more medical cards to people in this country than you did when you were in government. Thirdly, 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 you are continuing. You are continuing. In fact, in fact it's more. It's 500. Sorry, sorry, we're not it's 500. In the of shouting down people. Would you please allow me to reply to Deputy Kelleher? Thank you. 590,000. There are now 590,000. There are, there are now 590,000 more medical cards in the system than the were when Fianna Fáil were in government. That is a fact. In relation to your position, in relation to your position, and you're still opposing, and I can't understand 
why Fianna Fáil continues to oppose the government's plan to provide free GP care for children under six. It is something that will take, it is something that will take pressure off families, and it is also, it is also an essential building block. It's an essential building block. It's an essential building block for the introduction of a universal health insurance system. And in relation, in relation to the introduction of universal health insurance, as I said, it's not something that can be done overnight. It is something. It, it was not. And Would again, you, you don't stay quiet. You, know, you should Thank at you. least, Deputy Kelleher, inform yourself. Do a little bit of research. Do a little bit of research before you come in here. It was not. It was not promised. It was not. It was, it was never intended to be introduced overnight. It is something that requires careful consideration. That is why there is going to be a white paper. The white paper will be published when it is ready. I don't expect that that will be very far uh, into the future. And then you will have an opportunity. You'll have an opportunity, Deputy Kelleher, to condemn it and to criticise it, as inevitably you will do. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Jonathan O'Brien, on behalf of Sinn Féin. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ciarán Corla. Uh, Tánaise, since mid-December, this state has been battered by a series of very devastating storms. And the hardship, the destruction and the uh, devastation has been outlined uh, in a, a series of uh, debates we've had in here. And I know also, uh, that yourself and various ministers have visited those communities which are affected. So we're very aware. Sorry, Thanks. would you allow Deputy O'Brien, please, Thanks. without Thank noise you, in the background? Thank you. Thank you, Kankola. Tanisha, thanks to the work of local authorities and local communities with the assistance of government funding, many of those areas are now starting to get back on their feet. However, Tanisha, it will be a long journey for a lot of people. Uh, some people may never get the opportunity to reopen their business, Tarnister, because of the devastation which has been caused and the fact that they were uh, unable to get insurance from previous uh, sets of flooding, uh, Tarnister. And some areas are living in a constant state of readiness, waiting for the next event of flooding to happen. My own city of Cork and your county of Cork, uh, which Minister Hayes uh, visited very quickly after the last uh, set of flooding, was devastated to unprecedented levels uh, within the city centre, uh, Tarnishta. And at the time, there was three issues which we needed to deal with. The first was the immediate assistance which needed to be provided to homeowners and business owners, and that phase has now concluded or is at least very well advanced. The second one was in relation to business owners and homeowners who were unable to get insurance. And I know Minister Hayes is working hard on that issue with the insurance companies trying to get a memorandum of understanding. And you might give us an update on that. And the third phase, Minister, which was outlined by the government, was investing in flood defences in the longer term. And you stated at the time that there was about 250 million would be invested over the next five years. Now I think, Minister, we all know that that's not going to be enough to meet the challenges facing the state. In my own city of Cork, we're estimating about 100 million would be needed to put in place the flood defences. So, Minister, the question I want to ask is in relation to EU assistance. I know that the EU Solidarity Fund. Uh, is only available for uh, the assistance in the immediate aftermath of flooding and won't help with capital projects. And I know that the bar has been set very high. It's estimated that the amount of flooding damage and devastation would have to be in the region of 700 million for us to be able to apply for that. But Minister, you did state on the 20th of February that you were in discussions, your own department and the Department of Public Expenditure were in discussions with the EU Commission about the possibility of getting EU assistance in terms of funding to help alleviate flooding. And I'm just wondering, Minister, if you can give us an update on that, on those discussions. Are they still ongoing or have they concluded and what will the outcome? And the second one is just in relation to an update. Minister Hayes may be able to inform you on the discussions with the insurance industry, Minister, or Tarnisha. Tarnisha. Mr. Um, <coughs> well, first of all, I, I want to agree with um, Deputy O'Brien that I think that families and households who have been affected by the, the flooding, it is a devastating experience uh, for residential homes, for businesses, uh, and it is something that will take a very long time to, to recover from. Uh, I want to also uh, put on record my own appreciation and the appreciation of the government of all of those who work so hard to help people out uh, in the immediate uh, aftermath of the, the flooding. 
uh, people in the utility companies, uh, people in local employees of uh, local authorities, uh, public servants, and indeed the voluntary effort uh, that was contributed uh, by people at a local level. And indeed, I saw this very recently myself when I visited uh, Limerick and saw the uh, impact of the flooding there and indeed the work that uh, community um, uh, people in the community did uh, to help people out. May I also um, put on record uh, my tribute uh, to the late Michael O'Reardon, uh, who lost his life uh, in helping people getting uh, their electricity uh, power uh, restored. Uh, as you know, the government uh, response to the flood crisis was first of all to make funding available for the immediate issues that was done through the Minister for Social uh, Protection. Secondly, we provided 70 million uh, to deal with the aftermath of the flood, the, uh, mainly in infrastructural works and so on. And the local authorities are making, and many of them have made their submissions now to the Minister for the Environment, who's, uh, who's considering uh, those. And the third dimension of it, which you mentioned, is the issue of, uh, of flood defences. Now, you've asked me two particular questions. One is the issue of where we're going on the European front. Uh, we're still in discussions with the Commission in relation to uh, the issue of what assistance can be provided for the, you know, from European funding for uh, flood relief. I have to say, though, that the threshold is very high, and I think it is unlikely that it will make, if anything, it will make a very significant, I don't believe it will make a significant contribution to the cost that we have to bear on uh, dealing with the flood issue. However, uh, Minister Hayes has been in discussion with the European Investment Bank uh, particularly in relation to the flood defences uh, issue, and he's making uh, considerable progress uh, in, that, uh, in that area. You asked also about the insurance issue, and again, Minister Hayes has been in discussion with Sorry, the would you please, if you don't has been in discussion with the insurance uh, companies, and he expects to be able to complete a memorandum of understanding with the insurance companies within the next two months. Deputy O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Tony Minister, for your reply. First of all, can I welcome the fact that within two months we hope to conclude that those discussions with the insurance industry, and I think that will come as a relief if we can get a positive outcome, certainly for those businesses and homeowners who, unfortunately, through no fault of their own, find themselves unable to get insurance now. And I think that would be a, a, a certain, a very welcome development. Uh, and want to wish Minister Hayes the best of luck with that. In relation to the discussions with the European Investment Bank. Is that for flood relief assistance, or are we looking at uh, uh, discussions in relation to getting capital funding to help with the flood defences? Um, Tanisha, you also mentioned the threshold of the bar is set very high in terms of getting assistance from the EU Solidarity Fund. Uh, I think from a reply that you gave to a PQ recently, uh, Tanisha, you said that we would be looking at uh, damages up to around 700 million in order to qualify. No Minister, for a state this small, well, I, at least I would hope we would never see that level of devastation as a result of weather conditions. Therefore, Minister Artansha, it's very unlikely that we would ever qualify for assistance from the EU Solidarity Fund because of the very high criteria and bar that they have set. So is it a commitment from this government to try and um, have discussions on the possibility of changing those criteria to try and make them lower so in the event of future flooding that this state would be able to get some assistance for immediate flood relief? And is, is that part of the ongoing discussions that you're currently involved with, Minister, with the EU Commission? Thank you. Well, first of all, in relation to the discussions with the European Investment Bank, that's in respect of capital works, so it would mainly be for flood defences. As you know, the European Investment Bank uh, are already assisting us with some of the capital programme, uh, some of the uh, education uh, projects, for example, transport projects uh, that we have underway. So we're in discussions with the EIB to see if we can make, if you like, the capital, the, the capital works that are associated with flood defences uh, if they are amenable to uh, EIB, um, EIB funding, and that obviously would be a way of, you mentioned, for example, your own assessment of how far the 250 million that we have committed to will go to dealing with flood, uh, flood defences. So we're conscious of that, and therefore we're looking at ways in which the EIB can assist us uh, with that. So that's on the capital side. In relation to the EU Solidarity Fund. That operates on the basis of a percentage of GDP, and that's why the, the threshold, our estimate, is that we would have to have damages at the moment of 700 million in order to qualify uh, for that. 
Now, we are looking at seeing, the, because when the EU Solidarity Fund was established, it was established on a European-wide basis. And what we're looking at is to see if that can be broken down on a regional basis. In other words, the, the kind of weather impacts uh, that there are varies from, from region uh, to region, in which case the threshold might be lower uh, for those of us in this part of, uh, of Europe. That's one of the, the discussions that we're having on it. May I say that we are continuing to look at, you know, I mean, obviously, as with any program and any issue like this, we, we look to see uh, what we can maximise in terms of drawdown from EU programmes, and we're doing that in this case also. But we, at the moment, it seems to us that uh, we probably would qualify for very little, if anything, from the EU Solidarity Fund as it is presently uh, constituted, uh, and therefore we're likely to have to bear the, the cost of this ourselves. But we are looking at and we are in discussions about how the EU Solidarity Fund might be adjusted uh, on, an, on a regional basis that would enable us maybe to qualify for funding from it. Thank you. Deputy Donnelly. Thanks, Ken Corley. Uh, Tawnish, on Tuesday we heard from the special liquidator of IBRC that they had secured a voluntary agreement with the bidders for the Irish nationwide mortgages that they would voluntarily adhere to the Code of Conduct of Mortgage Arrears. Uh, yesterday the special liquidator appeared before the Finance Committee and we heard of this voluntary agreement that there'll be no oversight, there'll be no central bank inv involvement, there'll be no sanctions, there'll be no recourse to the financial ombudsman. And indeed, Tawnish, we found out that the voluntary agreement isn't even written down. So from the family's perspectives, I think it's fair to say that it's, uh, this voluntary agreement isn't worth the paper, that it's not even written on. But Tawnish, the, the second issue is that the nationwide mortgage holders want to bid on their own mortgages. Now, they've been refused, and the rationale given by the liquidator and by Minister Noonan is that allowing the mortgage holders to bid for their own mortgages would potentially drive down the total sales price, therefore exposing the state to legal challenge from creditors. Um, the sales process to this is based on a report from PwC. The Minister Noonan has refused to release the report and the special liquidator hasn't released it as yet, but we did find out some very useful things from the special liquidator about the report yesterday. Um, we know that the report recommended a single course of action, which, was the course, which is the course that's being followed. We know that the report did not evaluate different options in terms of the sales price. Uh, and indeed, the liquidator uh, agreed with the Finance Committee, or told the Finance Committee yesterday, Tawnish, that, that, in, that sales prices of the different scenarios were not provided. In other words, the liquidator has not been provided with advice that says, if you allow the mortgage holders to bid, we think the sales price would be this. And if you don't allow them to bid, we think the sales price would be something else. So, Tornish, it's still entirely possible that a sales price could be developed, which would allow the families to bid for their own mortgages, which would garner the same sales price or potentially even more than the current process. Um, we have an example in the media today. Uh, let's take one that we know about, which is Duncan Ballantyne. Time, uh, we know, Tornish, that, that Mr. Ballantyne offered the special liquidators 97% in the euro for his loans. But the special liquidator yesterday sold his loans as part of a tranche to Lone Star for 60% in the euro, uh, thereby getting 55 million euro less for Mr. Ballantyne's loans than has actually been achieved in yesterday's sale. So, Tornish, I think there is still an opportunity here, but time is ticking. The liquidator, based on the information he gave us yesterday, is acting on incomplete advice. Minister Noonan confirmed to me last night in response to a PQ that neither he nor any of his officials have even seen the report that this entire sales process is being based on. So, Tornish, can I ask you, is there, do you agree that there is an opportunity here to pause the sales process and for a thorough investigation to be done by Minister Noonan, by his officials, by the Finance Committee, to see if a process can be designed that allows the families to bid and that still returns Thank to the liquidator the same price. I do think, Thank Tornish, you. that Thank we you. have a very small window of opportunity to do enormous good for the, the many thousands of families who own these mortgages. Thank you. Here, here. Um, Corley, well, the special liquidators, as I understand it, has reached agreement uh, with the phase two bidders for the IBRC mortgage book. 
the agreement, I understand, provides that if successful in acquiring the portfolio, uh, the Phase two bidders will ensure that the relevant acquired mortgage loans are serviced in accordance with the Central Bank Code of Conduct on Mortgage Arrears. The Special Liquidators appeared before the Finance Committee yesterday and explained their decision. I understand that they were aware of the anxieties of mortgage holders and had noted the concerns expressed in recent weeks by the Minister for Finance and other members of the Oireachtas. Uh, I welcome this positive announcement and I would remind the House that the Government has always been clear that we would ensure that mortgage holders retain the protection of the CCMA. However, as the Government has previously stated, if it becomes evident that the voluntary application of the Code is not delivering the requisite protection for mortgage holders in arrears, government will bring forward the required legislation. Uh, looking beyond the IBRC loan book sale, uh, as discussed at the Oireachtas Finance Committee, the Department of Finance, the Central Bank and the Attorney General's Office are examining the applicability of the CCMA to unregulated firms and the need for uh, legislation uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Uh, we have continuously stated uh, that we expected any purchaser of the IBRC mortgage portfolio would service them in accordance with the CCMA, uh, and that remains the position. As the Deputy is aware, uh, the sales process has been uh, uh, under, undertaken and being pursued by the special liquidator. It's part of the liquidation, uh, it's part of the liquidation uh, process. Um, it operates um, uh, independently under um, uh, its own uh, legal, uh, legal basis, uh, but as far as uh, the government is concerned, uh, we are um, clear in our mind that we want to protect uh, the interests of the mortgage holders uh, in uh, the IBRC. Um, uh, the, there have been two previous sales of loan books, and in both cases, uh, the purchasers agreed uh, to the operation of the, uh, the CCMA, the continued operation of the CCMA. The two bidders in this case have uh, given an undertaking that they will follow suit on that. If they don't deliver on that undertaking, as I said, uh, the government uh, will bring forward what the, whatever the legislation is required. Thank you. Deputy Donnelly. I can only assume you picked up the wrong piece of paper to read out. I didn't ask you about legislation for the CCMA. I asked you if we can pause the sales process to figure out if, the, if a sales process can be devised that allows the families to bid on their own mortgages that returns the same or greater sales value to the liquidators. Let me give you a quick example from outside, from the protest outside Tornish there. There's a gentleman I spoke to, himself, his wife and his kids live in a home, they owe 220,000 euro, they're in arrears and they're not going to be in a position to pay that money back. The liquidator is going to sell his mortgage at a highly conservative estimate for about, for about 100,000 euro. It could be as little as 50,000 euro. He's going to sell that mortgage for, let's say, 100,000 euro. Now, this man and his wife could refinance at 150,000, but they're not being given the opportunity. So what is likely to happen, and I put this to the liquidator yesterday and he did not disagree, what is likely to happen is one of the two final bidders, both of whom are funds from the US who specialize in distressed assets, are going to buy this family's 220,000 euro mortgage for about 100,000 euro. They will quickly ascertain that he and his wife cannot pay that. They will then ascertain that there is equity in the house Thank you. and they will initiate repossession proceedings and they will evict him, his wife and his children. So that's what's coming for him. My question to you is, on the basis that the liquidator is acting on imperfect information and Minister Noonan hasn't even seen the advice, it is clear to me that a process could be devised that allows this man, his wife and his children and thousands of other families to stay in their homes by buying their mortgages back at the same, same price or even more that those mortgages are about to be sold to international funds that invest in distressed assets and what i'm asking is on the basis that what is about to happen is going to cause enormous and unnecessary distress in our country to tens of thousands Sorry, of men, women, you and children. Please, you're way over time can Thank you, you please examine whether the sales process can be paused so that we can at least try and figure out a process that allows these people to stay in their homes while still returning the same amount or more to the liquidator. Thank you. Open your eyes. Uh, 
Uh, well, Deputy Donnelly, you're very knowledgeable and you know how liquidations operate. You know how the liquidation process works. And you know too uh, the, risks, uh, the risks to the taxpayer uh, of an interference by the state uh, in the uh, liquidation uh, process. And it's easy to say, well, let's pause the same. Uh, there are consequences to that, uh, which might arise from actions taken by uh, other creditors, uh, other people involved in the IBRC uh, liquidation, uh, liquidation process. And you'd have to be very, very careful and very sure uh, that there wouldn't be an exposure to the taxpayer uh, of any such intervention uh, of, that, uh, of that kind. Secondly, I don't think the, I mean, this process is not concluded. Uh, what we have here, what the special liquidator told the committee, is that there are two bidders uh, that are arising from the uh, concerns that have been expressed about the position of the mortgage uh, holders. Uh, those two bidders have given an undertaking uh, that they will comply with the CCMA, as did uh, was the case in the sale of two previous uh, loan books uh, that, uh, that, uh, that have happened. But the sale process isn't complete. And I, I think it would be, I, I don't think it is wise to start to speculate about where the sales process will end up. We don't know. Uh, that's a matter for the special uh, liquidator. Uh, what I have said very clearly is that as far as the government is concerned, that we want to see the mortgage holders protected here. Uh, if uh, the uh, purchaser, whoever that may be at the end of the day, uh, does not meet the commitments uh, that we expect and the standards that we expect, uh, then the government is prepared to legislate. And such legislation would apply not just in the case of the IBRC mortgage holders, but in the case uh, of all, uh, uh, of all mor mortgage holders. In any, event, in any event, I think it is fair to say that cases that go before the courts, and you mentioned the issue of repossession, a repossession case would have to, in any event, uh, go before the courts, and we know the approach that the courts is taking, uh, and that is that they are expecting that the terms of the CCMA uh, would be applied. Thank you. That completes leaders' questions for today.